the juice, bro. Can uh, can you hear the stream in the background? I'm intentionally leaving Chaco's stream running, and I want to know if you can hear it. Let me know, please, and thank you. Yeah, I just muted. No big deal, man. I just want to know if you can hear it from my stream itself. <clears throat> oh, boy. Audio is good. Thank you. And you don't hear Chaco? Even better. Thanks, man. So I, I'm saying man and bro. I'm assuming gender here. Let me know. Correcto. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, I don't know if you caught the gist of what I do, um, but the goal for um, what I do uh, work-wise is to, to work with kids who are risk-immersed, hence the name. And uh, what uh, I do day in and day out with my staff is just work with uh, students who have been um, expelled from school for the most part, but also kids that have been um, in trouble with the law or uh, whatever the case may be. Um, our logo, all that kind of jazz. That's just a coaster thing I have for my coffee cup. But um, all, of our, all of our stuff is all rise above. My wife and I founded this, uh, oh, four years ago, five years ago, I guess, and um, have been steadily working towards uh, expansion. Now, uh, um, we're opening a second location here in town uh, in two weeks, which is kind of crazy. That was the middle school comment you heard me make. And um, uh, Grand Rapids, I'm in, I'm in Michigan, USA. And um, let me, uh, I'm gonna shut his stream down. <clears throat> Midwest, <laughs> where are you at in the Midwest? So anyways, we're, we're, why well, you type that? We're, um, oh, Wisconsin, nice. I almost took uh, a job out in Wisconsin. Um, can't remember exactly where, but I remember being uh, approached several times to take, to take work out there. But uh, yeah, so the, we're actually expanding a second location here um, in Michigan uh, in two weeks, um, changing our age group from high schoolers down to middle schools. The 13 districts here in town, um, <laughs> What's up, Pickle Man? Thanks for calling me nice things, bro. Um, I appreciate every bit of that. Uh, so we're open. The, the schools have asked us to open a, uh, another location to, to work with middle schoolers specifically, and then more recently uh, as well. Thanks for having. Thanks for having the time to show up, bro. Um, yeah, more recently, Grand Rapids has approached us and asked us to. To launch a location out there, and we're actually meeting with them in uh, oh, gee whiz, two weeks. Uh, fold and shirts, nice job, good old uh, male housekeeping, good job, keep it up, you're the best. Um, yeah, I think the twenty fourth, they're out here, and they're meeting with us to uh, uh, consider launching out there. It's going to be a bit of a stretch, but um, we're, we're going to do our best to make it work because we know that. Uh, See, and you brought up the, the very next point, Juice. It's, it's the idea of funding. We know that if we go out to Grand Rapids, it's going to be, A, it's going to be a challenge, and I'll explain that in a second, but um, the idea there 
is that Grand Rapids is very philanthropic. You know, you talk about funding. They, they have more uh, funding per capita than I think anywhere in, in Michigan and quite possibly most states in the U.S. Um, it's very conservative and uh, evangelistic. And uh, I think they would eat up a, an organization like ours. It is, we're kind of ministry-based anyways, so, I mean, it's, it's uh, something I think that they would really uh, leap all over and, and take advantage of. But uh, the, goal with, um, uh, the goal with going to Grand Rapids is that it would be a launching point, I think, um, for the rest of the state. And we would then move it into... Uh, uh, um, use it as a launching pad to get to other larger cities like Detroit and Ann Arbor and, and places like that. But the the goal with with Rise Above is 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 to work with schools, families, and, and whatnot, and um, to ensure that these kids don't get kind of lost in the system. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, the, the the students themselves um, are what's the word? They're handpicked. Kids come to us, they apply. Uh, it is not a guarantee when you walk in the door that I'm going to enroll you. You have to come in here and you have to uh, go through the, the steps to get to um, enrollment. Uh, and then once we've determined that you are a good candidate, you uh, enter into a, an agreement with us to, to carry forward and to, to do the one-year program. And uh, what we do is we get you ready. It's more social than anything else, and we get the students ready through counseling, therapy, and in other things. Um, some kids uh, focus just on academics. Some kids focus on social. Some kids do work. But the goal is always to, if they don't graduate high school well with us or uh, with the middle schoolers, that'll be a bit different. But um, if they don't graduate school while they're with us, we get them a job uh, as well. Uh, I, I'm... Myself, I'm a part of many groups in town, many different boards and whatnot. Uh, to say that I'm connected would be an understatement. <laughs> and we work very closely with the community to get these kids work, to get them uh, into relationships that are healthy uh, for them. And, uh, yeah, it is pretty cool. Um, you know, and it, it, I think that the, the weirdest part for me is I'm very entrepreneurial, but I never thought in a million years I'd be doing something like this. You know, I've had several of my own small companies. I've, I've worked for large organizations like Coca-Cola and uh, Warehouser, which is a large multinational American company. And uh, I've done some pretty high up there management things, VP level type stuff. And I had literally thousands of employees and I never thought in a million years I'd be running a little nonprofit uh, in Michigan that works with expelled high school kids. <laughs> uh, be honest, I never, I, I thought I'd be corporate America, so to speak. You know, I, I think the weirdest thing for me is I gave up, my brother-in-law said it best, I gave up the American dream. You know, I just built a house, um, everything to move to, to Michigan because I'm Canadian. My wife and I sold everything. I went to school and uh, got my degree and, and ended up staying here after we were done getting our degree. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's just weird. Weird to go from an environment where, you know, I've got dozens and dozens of employees and, and things of that nature, and then suddenly here I am. I've, I've got five people, <clears throat> pardon me, five people working for me and 12 kids running around the building. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I make it up as I go. I mean, who gets to do that? <laughs> it's phenomenal. I mean, oh, gee, you make it up every day. I mean, I get it. I mean, that's just the nature of who you are. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, am I making the dream possible? I don't know that I am, you know. Uh, it is definitely beyond myself. I, I agree with that a thousand percent. But, um, you know, but I, I think for the most of these kids, that really what it comes down to is for the first time in their lives, somebody's actually listening to them. That's the crazy thing. You know, when you think of, you know, I asked somebody this today. I had an interview for a, a teacher for our middle school today. And, and one of the questions I asked him, and, and I ask it to, of you guys as well, is if a kid comes to school and he falls asleep in the lunchroom before classes start, what assumptions do you make? You know, do you, you think the kid stayed up all night and played Fortnite? You know, was he up folding his clothes, pickle? <laughs> you know? What, 
Why did that kid fall asleep as soon as they came in? Does anybody assume for a second that that kid uh, is, uh, is asleep at school at 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning, whenever your students arrive? Is he asleep because his parents were up fighting all night? Or is he asleep because his parents were up partying all night? You know, his mom's a crack addict or heroin or whatever the drug of choice is nowadays. You know? I don't think anybody takes that into, into consideration. So what we do is that's where we start with every one of these kids is we assume that the home is broken, completely broken. Um, and that the students that we receive post-interview are a product of their environment. And our job is to weed through all that BS to get to the actual student. Because you got to remember, they're expelled. They're coming to us believing that they have nothing left. I, mean, I, I can't, it couldn't possibly get any worse. And then our schools expel them for whatever. And so when we get them, they literally have zero capacity to deal with any more of your crap. And so me going up to him, tapping him on the shoulder, telling him to get his butt up and do some math is useless. Think of your worst moment when you're as peeved off as you can be, when you've had enough with whoever is in front of you. And then picture a stranger coming in the room and saying to you, hey, come on, man, I need you to get back to work. If you don't kick the crap out of that guy, tell that guy to F off or storm out of the room yourself, like you are an excellent human being because most of us would do just that. I don't think it's something that we could, we could cope with n normally. And so when you take a kid, a kid, an immature student that has no means, no money, no car to escape, they can't just go home to, their, to whatever their house is away from the noise. So for us, we make our walls the safe place. We make it that escape. And out of that flows academics out of that building of capacity because then we then we take that quiet space and we get them to simmer down enough that we can then turn them into our friends and get them to do things they otherwise wouldn't do um, reasons I'm less inclined there's only one reason so every student that comes here is referred to us by the school um, any student that is declined is declined because they themselves said I don't want to be here if a student, by the end of the interview, looks me in the face and says, I want to do this, I accept them. If, they, if I ask them at the end of the interview, because I haven't sensed it already, if I, if I look at the student and I say to them, are you ready? Do you, do you want to do this? You, you understand I have the time to pay attention to you. I am not going to deal with your crap. We are going to get over this, and it's going to be hard. Do you want to come along for the ride? If that student says yes, they're in. I won't say no. No matter what brought them to me, whether it's, they, whether it's because they beat up a teacher or a bunch of teachers, um, whether it's because they brought a, a loaded gun to school with the intent to hurt somebody, which is probably 40 to 50% of our population, believe it or not. Um... Juice, no, I, I don't know that I am inspired by, by them. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, all of... Yeah, I knew, I knew what you meant, don't worry. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what, uh, what inspired me. I'll be honest with you. I don't know where any of this came from. Uh, outside of a... I have my own... I have three of my own kids. I have a deep desire to, to not be miserable my entire life. You know? You can laugh or you can cry, but crying gets old really fast. It's my life. You know, and, and, and speak of my life. Here, I'll give you the, the, the nutshell. So why does, why does, you know, Neil, risk immerse, whatever the heck you want to call me, why do, why do I relate? Why, why would you even say for a second that I'd be passionate about something like this? Well, let's, let's look at me. So on the earth, there's, there's something called um, uh, ACE scores. 
adverse childhood effects, things that affect who you become. So as a young person at four years old, the last time my parents were in the same, living in the same home together involved um, big guns. Involved me and my mom and my brother hiding under the kitchen table. Involved my mother saying to me at four years old, go get daddy's guns. Right? So I lived in, a, in an environment growing up that was broken. Um, I was kidnapped the following year by my father. I, um, I was taken and held until my mom would give my dad whatever it is that he wanted. Uh, I, I was abused by my brother. Uh, my father did not pay child support. I grew up very poor. Um, what else? Bounced from house to house. I was always in trouble at school. Had my own desk, literally my own desk with my name on it, outside the principal's office. Uh, my eighth grade teacher, I'll never forget her name, I won't say it here because it's not polite dragged me out of class pinned me against the wall and said to me to my face in 8th grade you will be a loser your entire life just like your brother well she should know my brother isn't perfect mind you but he's very successful he was actually the VP of a bank in Canada so she was uh, a great judge of character and I don't think I've done too shabby myself but in spite of all of that, you ask the question, okay, so what, what made me successful? In spite of all of the things that happened, the fact that I hated my parents growing up. I have a phenomenal relationship with them now. I love them both dearly. They're broken people just like everybody else. Why was I successful? Yes, they do, Stone. Absolutely. <laughs> or something like that. They need proper evaluations, whether it's uh, job-related or otherwise. But what, what made me successful? Well, there, I, th I believe there's a couple things for me intentionally. Spe uh, sorry, specifically. One was I had one constant and healthy relationship in my life. Someone that I knew at a moment's notice I could count on. My grandmother, my dad's dad. A little Portuguese lady, could barely speak English, would come once a week with one bag, a little grocery bag. And in it, she would have a bag of Doritos, a couple cans of Pepsi, uh, a little baggie with $5 in it. Um, and that woman made sure to, to tell me that I was loved every time she saw me. Did that fix everything? No. But it, it gave me someone to depend on. Only one person, but it was someone. Right? No, and it, you're right. Oh, Picklet is deep. But the, it's, the, it's the intention behind what we do. And the, it's the launching pad for every future conversation that we're going to have on this channel. And everyone that comes in. Right? So when we have a conversation in the future, it's based off of this. The other contributing factor, yes, they do, uh, Stone, have big brothers, big sisters in Canada. The other contributing factor was at 15, um, I joined the military. I joined the Army, and um, I became a machine gunner. I remustered a year or two years in, whatever it was, and became a paramedic. But um, And Master Corporal Akpada, absolutely kicked my backside and made me cry. But I loved him. I knew I could trust that guy with anything. And he never let me get away with anything. That's how I knew he would always be there. Same with my grandmother. She always kicked my butt when I did wrong. And I knew absolutely she would show up every week with that little bag. Same thing Master Corporal Akpada did. And that is exactly what we do with the kids here. We show up every day. Exactly, Juice. It, that is us now. Now we show up every day with something, whatever that something is, 
and we give it to them every day in spite of whatever has transpired, whatever emotion has been expressed, right? Whatever uh, 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 thing brought them to us. And it's funny because in, in the interview, when I'm talking to the kids, when I first meet them, by the end of the interview, I turn to the parents and the student and I say, did you notice something? And they kind of look at me for a second and I said, have you noticed yet that I didn't ask you why you got expelled. I never asked them. I never asked them why they got expelled. And they go, yeah, I was wondering when you're going to ask me about that. And I say to them, point blank, I don't care. It makes no difference if I know that you brought a gun to school, you beat up your teacher, you did drugs in the bathroom, or you just never showed up. I, I say to them, what matters is what you're going to do for me tomorrow. The fact that you showed up today is already a hundred times better than what you did yesterday. Let's build off of that. And by this point, usually mom is crying. The student is like dazed, doesn't know what to do. And I'm like, are you ready? It's not going to be easy. Let's go. So we have four, four pillars and then I have another model that I use. And I'll, I'll refer to these guys uh, a lot. The first is, I believe, relationships come first before, before everything. Uh, thank you for following, Stone. Um, math, science, whatever's going on will stop in order for me to preserve whatever uh, relationship I'm trying to form with this kid. So if this kid is having a meltdown, I'm not going to say, come on, you got to get math and science done. You got to focus on this thing. Well, no, that's not the point because that thing is irrelevant if I can't focus on it. If I'm destructive relationally, if I'm destructive with whoever's in front of me, I have to be able to cope first before I can even care about math and science. And so we focus specifically on uh, the building of healthy relationships with students. Uh, second is, I believe relationships should um, vary depending on the student. Uh, Juice, I'm not going to talk to you the same way I talk to the pickle. Dear God, I swear I will never talk to you in the same way I talk to the pickle because I respect you, Juice. Sorry, pickle. <laughs> the point there is um, we get... Oh, you're soft. That's good. Um the pickle is not soft. He's, he's Vlasic. He's got a little crisp to him. Um, for, I don't know, for, uh, think about it for hours. Yeah, yeah, it's therapy, man. I'm telling you, it works great. Um, if we treat, and that's, this is the issue with schools, is that they treat every student um, like, a, like a blanket policy, right? If this happens, we have to do this one thing. So if you bring drugs to school, I have to kick you out for five days. Or if, if you tell a teacher to F off, I have to kick you out of class and give you this. You know, all, these things have, there's triggers, right? And what we say is no, we, we believe that the event should have circumstances. That there are, or that there are circumstances that trigger the event. And therefore, those triggers should be taken into consideration when we talk about things like relationship or discipline. So when I discipline a kid or when I congratulate a kid or when I come alongside a new student, I'm going to treat them different than every other kid. Just like if you have multiple kids of your own, you don't love on them all the same. Some want a hug. Some don't want get, don't touch me, dad. Some want to, like my son has been lifting weights with me the past month. And I love when I work out, if the guy that spots me stands over me and yells at me, gets angry with me. Come on, Fernandez, push, 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 you know. I want to be encouraged. I want that, oh, you can do it. My son, if I even count the reps for him, he tells me to shut up. <laughs> not negatively, not like, but he's like, Dad, please, don't. don't. Don't talk while I'm doing this. And you need to know that. Because you can frustrate the hell out of a kid in the simplest ways, if you don't know the simplest things about them. It's called the love language. Look it up. The other thing I want you to do, hey, Scatter, what's going on? The other thing I want you to do is I want you to look up um, 
ACE scores, A-C-E, capital A-C-E scores, and take it. Take the test. It's a little 10-question test, and I want you to see what score you take. Um, and we'll talk about those in weeks to come. Just see where you're at. The third thing uh, when it comes to relationship is we believe that we should share our relationships. So, so Juice, you, you've been chatting quite a bit here. So you and I get to be fast friends. We, we chat every day, and I know you, you got this, this great thing that you do, and, and say it's basketball. You and I, we play basketball every Saturday now, and, and we're, you know, we, I love playing basketball. And, you know, you're a good guy, you're, you know, you got a family, you got a good job, you, all these things are going on for you, you know what I mean? You're successful. Um, yay for you. I got a Kemp come through the door, and he has one thing in common with you. Basketball. Oh, Juice, what'd you say, bro? Oh, too many, uh, I got to fix that. Sorry, man. <laughs> Don't worry about that. That wasn't your fault. Um... My goal is to introduce that kid to you because that's a healthy relationship. My job is to share what I know is good with you, right? So if you enter into that kid's life, whether it's for work, whether it's for mentoring, tutoring, whatever it is, a good thing going in will push a bad thing out the backside. You follow me? A little bit of nature for you there. Yeah, I hear you. I I understand. I, you don't you don't even begin to understand how much I, I I I hear what you're what you're talking about. It's scary stuff, bro. Absolutely scary stuff. Um. You know, and the best thing that you can do in that situation is exactly what we do every day. It's just say, look, it sucks. I know. Bad things happened. We know. It's over. Focus on what we have here today and let's move forward. All right? Use those as launching pads for better things. And that's literally what we do every day. And the fourth uh, relational thing that we, we talk about all the time um, is the idea that we believe our relationship should endure post-program. Yeah, that, absolutely. And that's the front, this is exactly point four that I'm talking about, uh, Juice, is, is like my daughter, she's 21 now. She got married two years ago. When she got married and moved out of my house, I didn't stop talking to her, right? Yes, I see her less. Yes, we communicate far less. She doesn't at my dinner table every day, but she's still my daughter. I still have a deep relationship with her. Um, I still love her to death. Um, and that's the same way we work with these kids. Um, now, if my daughter left my house and, and I saw her once a year, and, and yeah, I would be disappointed and I would want to see her more, but you know, wouldn't change my opinion of her. And, and with these students, it's the same thing. We asked them at, on their last day, do you, do you want us to keep in touch with you? Um, and I, I want to come back to that disciplining for everything thing in a, in a second, Juice. Um, and if they say yes, we intentionally, we text them fairly regularly. We, we will take them for dinner. We'll go to a Cracker Barrel or whatever the case is with the kids. You know, not all, sometimes all at the same time. Sometimes you pick, you know, one or two up at, at once. We invite them to events. We have s'mores and fires at my house. <laughs> um, invite them to church. That's a thing. You know, one of the craziest things is we send them birthday and Christmas cards. And I got a kid who I'm getting a, a job here in town, actually graduated from our program a year ago. Um, I sent him, my wife sent him a Christmas card to last Christmas, not this one that just passed, the one before. And, uh, but a week later, I took him to Taco Bell. Just him and I. I went to Taco Bell, grabbed some tacos. I love Taco Bell. Don't know why, but I do. Long story short, about halfway through our talk about it, he looks me straight in the eye and very emotionally says, oh, and by the way, Mr. Fernandez, thank you. Um, I got your Christmas card. I'm like, yeah, buddy, no problem, man. Um, hope you liked it. And he said, no, Mr. Fernandez, you need to understand. That's the first time I've ever gotten a Christmas card. My mom has never even given me a Christmas card. The kid's 18 years old. 
18 never received a stinking Christmas card. It's not hard. <laughs> it's literally not hard. And you're right. You take these kids, you put them in a setting like this, because again, you're, you're, you're taking the bottom 1%, right? And you're putting them all in one group. And so things are going to happen. Conversations are going to happen. Um, activities are going to happen. Nothing ever catastrophic happens, but things you got to be on top of. And uh, you do. You want to discipline. You want to say, hey, come on, guys. Say, stop, 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 stop. You know, settle down, whatever. They're teenagers, though. You've, you've got to let some things go as long as it doesn't cause harm or hurt anybody, right? Uh, our over willingness to respond in negative ways is huge. Uh, and that's that's probably the hardest thing for an adult to learn. That's why when I hire teachers, I don't hire a retired teacher from the school system. I look for somebody that is out of out of that loop, you know, that is is either new to teaching or somebody that has some other weird background that would relate. Uh, teachers are no offense to any teachers. Um, there might be one that would work phenomenal in this environment, but they're too rule driven. And um, we, we, we use something called trust-based relational intervention, where through trust, we build relationships. And I'll explain this. So follow with me. Trust, obedience, challenge, change, growth. Right? Trust, obedience, challenge, change, growth. It's called, I call it the coach effect. I'm sure it has a more formal name, but I call it the coach effect. It goes like this. If you trust me enough, think of a coach, a football coach or a soccer coach or something like that as I say this. If you trust me enough to listen to me, know that I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to ask you to do things you never thought were possible. Right? I'm going to make you uh, look a certain way. I'm going to make you talk a certain way. I'm going to make you do things that you normally would not do. But if you trust me enough to listen to me, accept the challenge, I guarantee you things will change. You with me? You'll get better grades. Heck, you're going to graduate high school. That thing you, you just got kicked out of, we're going to fix this. Your relationships with your friends and family are going to improve. And I bet you you're going to make new friends, friends you never thought you could have. And if you trust me enough to listen to me, accept the challenge, and start to change some of the things that you do, brother, I guarantee you are going to grow into something you never thought was possible. Not only you, but your mom, your dad, your friends, your family, your school. Never thought you can do. And the crazy thing is that if you trust me enough to listen to me, to accept the challenge, change some of the things, and, and, and walk with me as you grow, something crazy is going to happen. You're going to come right back to this thing called trust. You're going to look me in the face and say, Mr. Fernandez, tell me more. Remember Master Corporal Akpata. Master Corporal Akpata kicked the crap out of me. <laughs> Made me cry. But that guy couldn't talk to me enough. I wanted more. I trusted that guy. And I would go back to him and back to him and back to him. In the same way that if you had a coach in high school, somewhere in your life, whatever, whenever it was, and it could be a work coach, it could be a basketball, it, was, it can be a coach, whatever that coach is for you. In the same way that a kid who had a football coach years later can be walking down the street pushing a stroller. Even a kid, like you said, you have three kids out of wedlock. Even a kid that the mother is no longer in sight or the dad's no longer in sight. You will run across the street to show your coach, look at this thing I made because you're so proud. You want to just show coach, coach. Because what you're saying is, coach, pat me on the back because I did a good thing. Because you trusted your coach. And so when your coach does something that is challenging to you, 
and you get stronger. You grow into a better player. You go, holy crap, I did it. I did that thing he said I couldn't do. The crazy thing about this is that it is very difficult for somebody close to you to do this for you. Example, my sons, both of my boys, are competitive soccer players. My, actually, my oldest son actually plays um, for university here in town and is on a scholarship. Very good soccer player. For years, I coached soccer. That's how I met my wife, coaching soccer in high school. Um, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and when uh, my son was growing up, I would say to him, son, I need you to do this thing. So when the ball comes, I want you to receive the ball, move a certain way, cut across the field like this, kick the ball, you'll score a goal every time. Perfect, no problem. Yeah, dad, yeah, dad, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. He would never do it. Never do it. And I'd watch him play soccer. I'm like, oh, come on, just do the thing, you know? One day, years later, after saying the thing all the time, he comes home to me and he says, hey, dad, oh my gosh, in practice today, I was killing it. I scored a bunch of goals. We were, you know, split up in teams, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, really, what happened? And he says, oh, yeah, I was talking to coach and we were sitting on the sidelines and coach says to me, you know, when I... When, I, when the ball comes, receive it this certain way and cut across the field. And when I get to this point, shoot the ball. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, for years I've been saying the same thing. You never listened. But it took a coach. Because you see, for me, I have a personal relationship with my son that is too close. This is a whole different dynamic now. This is something that is, is, is um, critical. And juice. It depends how connected you are to, your, to these kids. You can still be the coach, right? And so when my son came home um, and said, coach did that thing, I was mad. <laughs> I was like, but I've been saying it forever. You just, you're not listening to me. And But when coach said it, I had to shut the mad off that emotional response, and I had to turn into a thankful response. At least he understands now. I wish it was for me because I want that pat on the back myself. Hey, good job, Dad. You did a good job. No, it doesn't matter. Did he learn what you needed them to learn? Yes. And so for us, we become that surrogate coach for parents because although we have some very destructive parents, um, there are a lot of parents that still love their students and want them to be successful. So um, is there a way I can help my kids uh, form more of that kind of uh, a connection? Yeah, again, we'd have to talk um, in depth about your relationship with your kids and stuff like that. Um, and who do you know who the good coaches are? Um, you know, good coaches are people that generally are selfish, selfless people, um, those who uh, go out of their way in intentional ways. Um, and uh, coaches like that unfortunately are, are hard to find they're, they're not everywhere they're few and far between sadly and uh, I think as we, as we go further in this uh, we can have that conversation I don't have uh, time to get into it a whole lot today I've got about five more minutes and I gotta, I gotta get going but the, the important thing here is you understand the basis of what we do so that when we get to the point where I'm sitting here interviewing somebody across from me in the cage, you understand the basis for the questions that I'm asking. You understand where a student is coming from when they say, I love this place. Because I want you to ask the question, why do you love it? I want the student to have to answer that and articulate what it is that they love, you know. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for following directions. Appreciate it. <laughs> Got to get you over here teaching. Well, when you're ready to launch one in Wisconsin, let me know. I'll I'll, uh, I'll bring a rise above out that way, and we'll we'll do some risky things out in Wisconsin. I don't think I ever answered your question. Funding. Let's let's do that real quick. 
Um, Rise Above is privately funded. Uh, part of this stream, once I'm affiliated, if we ever get to that point, I um, need to get my, my viewer counts up and whatnot, but um, the, uh, completely privately funded. So we rely on individuals who give cash donations. We rely on um, businesses that donate. Um, we do receive some grants, uh, but those are grants that I apply for. Um, they're not like uh, government grants. I don't go anywhere near government stuff. Um, they don't need control over what I do. Uh, what else? Oh, and the schools partner with us. The big one. <laughs> the schools love what we do. Um, when I launched Rise Above, they said, oh, great. Yeah, another, another group that's going to help us. Um, and what I said is, you know, I want to help you, but if you don't think it's worth it, then don't pay. I don't want you to pay a dime. And so for two years, I said to them, don't pay. You sure? Yeah, yeah, no, don't pay. My donors will take care of things. Don't pay. Two years in, they came to me and said, well, wait a second. We love what you're doing. It's working. <laughs> Our kids are coming back. They're not reoffending. We want to pay. And so the schools told me that they were going to pay. I didn't ask them. They told me they were going to pay, which is cool. Yeah, and you know what? We do some fundraising. That's another avenue. Um, we do a golf outing and, and different things like that. People donate through our Facebook page and, and stuff. So it's kind of cool, but um, <clears throat> pardon me. The uh, I'm losing my voice if you can't tell. I'm not normally this uh, suave in deep voiced. Um, but yeah, funding is, is tricky. It really is. But uh, it's possible. It is possible. Uh, we do what we do purely because uh, we have some amazing donors and people that give, you know, $5 here, $1,000 there, $10,000 here. You know, it's it's crazy. We have one family that's donated almost four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. I I forget exactly what the number is off the top of my head, but it's been incredible to uh, to see the generosity of people as they've come alongside uh, the students in significant ways. So, but um, schedule wise, this is a bit of a test stream. Um, I will be uh, on a regular schedule probably starting next week with regards to. Uh, this I'm guessing I will be streaming 11 o'clock noon ish each day um, I'd say two three times a week I hope for the most part it's going to be this it's going to be either me talking me interviewing somebody either in-house or via some other media um, in which case you'll see them on screen, not just, not just me. And um, occasionally we might play a game, but I doubt it. Um, I'm not a great gamer. Um, I want to play with the OG Pickle just because I want to make him look bad on, on his game. So, um, But I, <laughs> I'll probably be interviewing um, a few of the larger streamers that I'm associated with. Uh, they've a few of them have already said that they're they're down for that. I might do a weightlifting stream. Um, for those that don't know, I love to lift weights. I've been in in the back in the gym again for about a year now. And but I've done it on and off for several years. I uh, got into it in high school and and uh, yeah, found it again at 44. An old guy lifting weights, love it. But all right, guys. Um, hope you all have a good evening. I'm going to go pick up my son, speaking of uh, the devil, and uh, <clears throat> see if we can't get... Uh, yeah, Halifax does a good stream too, so... Yeah, I've, I, I'm not sure how I want to do it though, um, but I'll get there. Hey, Toos, thanks for popping in, buddy. I appreciate it, man. Hopefully, um, hopefully I get to see you guys more uh, in the future. But uh, <clears throat> I'm going to lose my voice. 
but either way, we'll we'll figure out um, a, a stream where I can where I can get in the gym and and uh, and do stuff. I know I've done some YouTube videos uh, in the past. I've since deleted and whatnot, but um, on just different types of lifts and how to get stronger, particularly um, for the older folks, uh, how to get uh, in back into the gym without hurting yourself and and uh, and do that kind of stuff. So you might just see YouTube videos from me, or I might link stuff in chat and and whatnot. But uh, either way. Uh, we'll we'll get there uh, over the next few weeks. Figure this out with with your guys' help, and and uh, um, hopefully get some pretty fun people on stream uh, to chat with. Uh, kind of because the goal for me is I don't think Chaco and and Boom and and Swag and and and, and WTF and and uh, the Chicken of Destiny understand the impact on the population that they serve. Um. Uh, and, and that's what I want to explore with them. I want to talk about their audience and what impact they think they have on them. So, guys, there is a suggestion box uh, down below the stream. Please, please fill that out. Ask questions there so I have stuff to come back to. Um, I, I purge them occasionally, but uh, if you can put stuff in there, that'll help me uh, figure out the direction to take the stream on a given day. And... Uh, uh, and, and kind of go from there. So uh, feel free to ask questions. I look forward to seeing you guys again. And uh, behave. Stay out of trouble. And uh, don't be too risky, guys. Appreciate you all for coming in today. We'll, uh, we'll see you all soon. Bye for now.